If you go for a walk in the woods and look around, nature will look asymmetric to you. But if you look closer at a water drop and start zooming until you see its molecules, you will find symmetricity. What I want to show you in this video is how a beautiful theory makes use of these symmetries to understand how the molecule vibrates. As an example, let's consider an ammonia molecule made of three hydrogen atoms and one nitrogen atom. We can think of the atoms as being connected to each other by virtual springs. Each atom can vibrate in some direction and we define by V1, V2, V3 and V4 the displacement vectors. In order to find the modes of vibrations of the molecule, we can use Newton's law to find a set of differential equations. You don't need to understand these equations, neither do you need to know what is a differential equation, but you may appreciate to see how their structure simplifies. If we set each time dependent vi equals to some ui times sine of omega t, so we do this for every atom, which means we are looking for oscillations in the ui's directions, then the equations simplify. If you look carefully to these equations, you see that they can be written in a matrix form, where for each atom I use the notation ui as a vector element to encapsulate its three components. In the same way, each matrix element is in fact a three by three matrix. If we define by u the giant 12 row vector containing all displacement vectors and by a the 12 by 12 matrix, we identify an eigenvalue problem. If you don't know what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, I recommend you the Tree Blue One Brown series of videos on linear algebra. The interesting thing here is not to understand the elements of A, but notice how by defining this eigenvalue problem, we have defined a 12th dimensional vector space. And what is left now to understand is what are the symmetries of this vector space and how to formulate them mathematically. Looking at the NH3 molecule, we see for example that a 120 degrees rotation about the z-axis keeps the system invariant. What I mean is that the molecule configuration would stay the same as the hydrogen atoms are indistinguishable. A rotation acts in two ways on our displacement vectors. The atoms change position and the displacement vectors are rotated. For example, the new atom 1 position is occupied by the rotated atom 3. This is why the new displacement vector u1 prime is equal to r u3, where r is the rotation matrix. Doing this for every atom, we obtain four transformations. Again, we can write it in a matrix form and define by gamma of C3 this 12 by 12 matrix. We have found an invariant transformation of our 12 dimensional vector space. As you may imagine, this is not the only one in this problem. Let's take a look now at a mirror transformation on the x equals 0 plane, or in other words, inverse the x-axis. This time, only atoms 1 and 2 exchange position, and all displacement vectors are x-inverse, which means they are multiplied by a m matrix representing the inversion. Again, we obtain four transformations which can be written in a matrix form. Defined by gamma of sigma 1, this new matrix. To summarize, we found how to write the matrix of a 120 degrees rotation, and of a mirror on the x equals zero plane. There are still other invariant transformations. Obviously, the identical transformation will not change it on. The 120 degrees rotation, but in the opposite direction. And two other mirror transformations. Using the gamma notation, we can write compactly these invariant transformations and define now what invariant means in our problem. Starting from our eigenvalue problem, invariance means that 
if u is an eigenvector array with eigenvalue omega squared, then also should be u prime. Therefore, a u prime is equal to omega squared u prime. If we now use the definition of u prime and insert that omega squared u is equal to a u by the definition of the problem, we get a simple relation for our matrices. Take now a step back and look at how a few symmetry considerations have helped finding six relations for our A matrix. This is where physics now needs the help of mathematics, because we are left with an only mathematical question, which is, how can these relations help finding the eigenvalues of A? And the answer to this question is given by group representation theory, which I will now briefly introduce. But before getting deeper in the theory, we have to start with some definitions. The first thing we want to define is what is a group. Formally, it is a set of abstract elements with a given multiplication law. This law has to be defined for every pair of elements and has to follow some properties that I won't cite here because they are not necessary for this video. In our context, these abstract elements represent symmetry transformations, such as rotations and reflections, which we denoted before by C3, Sigma1, etc. And we define the multiplication between two elements as the result from applying the transformations from right to left. For example, to compute Sigma1 times C3, we first apply the rotation C3 and then the reflection Sigma1. And we remark that it is equivalent to a reflection exchanging atoms 2 and 3, which we call Sigma2. Therefore, we set sigma1 times c3 equals sigma2. We can write this product in a table whose purpose is to define all the products of the group. Doing the same process for each pair of transformations, we can fill the table. This multiplication table completely defines our group, commonly called the c3b group. Now that we are more familiar with the notion of groups, let's define group representations. For a given group, such as our C3V group, a representation associates each group element J to some square matrix D of J, giving a set of matrices which must obey the following rule. This rule ensures that the matrices multiply in the same way as the group elements. For example, since we set sigma1 times C3 equals sigma2, the matrix of sigma1 times the matrix of C3 should be equal to the matrix of sigma2. And this should be true for all products of our group. There can exist infinitely many different representations of a given group. But let's look at some examples for our C3V group. First, we have a simple 1D representation where each rotation is assigned 1 and each reflection is assigned minus 1. Then we have a 2D representation where the matrices are the rotation and reflection matrices in two dimensions. For both representations, you can check that they indeed obey to the multiplication table I gave you before. Finally, remember the 12-dimensional gamma matrices representing the invariant transformations of the NH3 molecule. They also form a representation since they obey to the same product law as the group. Since we saw that operating C3 and then sigma1 is equivalent to operating sigma2, the transformation gamma of C3 followed by gamma of sigma1 is equivalent to the transformation gamma of sigma2. Now that we have this definition, let's define a special case of representations called reducible representations. A representation is said to be reducible if there exists a subspace invariant under each matrix, which means if the representation acts in a vector space V, you can find a subspace U for which if you apply the matrices to a vector U of the subspace, the result D of G U will still be in the subspace. And this should be true for all the matrices of our representation. If you are not familiar with these notions of invariant subspace, 
and prefer to visualize things, there is an equivalent definition which is that a representation is said to be reducible if in some basis the matrices can be cut in four blocks where one off diagonal block is zero. For example, this matrix would be in the desired form, but this matrix wouldn't. As I said, this form must be found in some basis, so the choice of the basis is really important. Remember that if we want to change the basis of the matrices D of J, the new matrices are written as follows, with a matrix S which must be invertible. These matrices form a new representation D prime, which is said to be equivalent to our previous representation D. I think it may be useful to illustrate this change of basis on an example. So let's come back to our C3V group and take this 2D representation I gave you before. If, for example, in our change of basis, we keep the first vector unchanged and replace the second vector by the sum of the two vectors, we apply a transformation with this matrix S, giving us new matrices D prime. Notice that these matrices are still not in the reducible form. In fact, there is no invariant subspace in this case. These representations, which are not reducible, are called irreducible and play a very important role in our theory. An important result is that there only exist a few non-equivalent irreducible representations of a finite group. For any group, we always have the trivial 1D representation where each group element is associated to the number 1. Now, if we look at our C3V group, there exist two other irreducible representations. The 2D representation I gave you just now, and the 1D representation I mentioned in the examples before. These three representations are all the irreducible representations of the group. It means that if you take any irreducible representation, it will be equivalent to one of them. These irreducible representations act as the atoms or the prime numbers of the theory. The fact is that any representation can be decomposed in irreducible representations, in the same manner that any number can be decomposed in prime factors. Starting from any representation, such as this frightening representation, with a well-chosen change of basis, the representation will be equivalent to a block diagonal representation, where each block corresponds to one irreducible representation. In this example, we have D1, D2, and D3. The technical part here is to find the change of basis. It requires some mathematical tools that I will not present in this video. To make our lives easier, we can write compactly this decomposition using the direct sum notation. In general, an irreducible representation can appear more than one time in the decomposition. Now that we know how to decompose any representation, let's formulate a consequence of a lemma called Shor's lemma. This lemma helps to diagonalize a matrix if we know that it commutes with all the representation matrices. First, consider the case where each irreducible representation appears at most one time in the decomposition, as in our previous example. Then, if we choose the basis in which the representation is block diagonal, the matrix A will be diagonal in this basis. So, the eigenvectors of A are simply the new basis vectors. Now, in the case where some representation appears more than one time, for example, if the two-dimensional representation D3 appears two times in the decomposition, then the block corresponding to 2D3 will be filled by diagonal 2D blocks. We finally are all set to come back to our physics problem.
Remember, we were trying to find the eigenvalues of this matrix, knowing that it commutes with the invariant transformations of our NH3 molecule. We saw in details two of these invariant transformations. First, the rotation C3, whose matrix gamma of C3 is given as follows using the compact notation. But don't forget that it is a 12-dimensional matrix, which we can write explicitly. We also saw the reflection across the x equals 0 plane sigma 1, whose compact matrix gamma of sigma 1 is written as follows. Again, it might be useful to clarify the compact notation. As said earlier, all these transformations form a representation of the C3V group. Using the tools I did not present in this video, but which may be subject to another video, we can find the decomposition of our representation, and find the basis in which it becomes block diagonal with our 3D1, D2, and 4D3 blocks. Changing the basis of A into the new basis, we obtain a new matrix A prime where to free space I have defined new variables. As expected by Shaw's lemma, the matrix A is block diagonal with three blocks corresponding to D1, D2 and D3. Since D1 and D3 appear more than one time in the decomposition, their corresponding block weren't expected to be diagonal. In general, we would expect 9 1D subblocks in the D1 block and 16 two dimensional diagonal subblocks in the D3 block. In our case, we are happy that some of these subblocks are zero. To really diagonalize the matrix, we make a final step, which is to change the order of our vectors. With a well chosen change of the basis vectors positions, the new matrix A' prime prime becomes block diagonal with small 1D, 2D and 3D blocks. To summarize, group representation theory has allowed to reduce the hard diagonalization of a 12-dimensional matrix to an easy diagonalization of 2D and 3D matrices. We didn't even have to understand the matrix elements, as we only considered symmetric transformations. And after having found these transformations, we only use some mathematical tools to simplify the problem. If you want to learn more, I recommend this book from Howard Georgi, which tells you about the tools such as character tables that I did not mention in the video. It also speaks about how this theory generalizes to infinite groups and infinite dimensional representations. Thanks for watching the video and feel free to let a comment if something was not clear to you.